All right, welcome to Marin School of the Arts. Uh, today we have Aron Serfati, the director of the Afro-Latin Jazz Ensemble at University of Southern California. Studio drummer, percussionist, artist, teacher, all that stuff. Uh, happens to be probably the best jazz teacher I've ever <laughs> been around, clinician-wise. The most well-spoken uh, as, as our kids are coming to know this week, so... I just have a couple of questions. We'll keep it loose, fun. Sure. Um, I would like everyone to know about your upbringing in Caracas and okay. kind of maybe what got you into music, where it led you, how it got you to where you are now. What? <laughs> Thank you for having me here at the school. It's a, it's a great program that you're running, and the kids are fantastic. It's always a pleasure coming back. Uh, my upbringing, music. It was a, uh, my dad asked me when I was five years old, what if I wanted to learn an instrument? And I said, drum. I took one lesson and forgot all about it. <laughs> when I was 15, I was, I had a girlfriend and she, um, she said, well, we can't see each other during the week. Why don't you do something? Learn, you know, learn to play guitar, learn <laughs> piano, learn drums. And when she said drums, my eyes went up. Okay. Like okay, so I started taking lessons, and it's been nonstop since then. Awesome. So your bio says you started playing when you were twelve, and then you were playing professionally by fifteen. No, I started or playing at fifteen and professionally by seventeen. Ah, okay. And then how how did you end up in the U.S.? I, <laughs> my dad um, had a record company back in Venezuela, and he had. Uh, the oldest record manufacturing plant in Latin America. Uh, he was a representative for R RCA Records, so music was always around the house. I would sit down and play on the drums and play along to music. So I would play to Earth, Wind and Fire mm. and the Bee Gees and uh, you know, Antonio Carlos Jobim, and I was able to hold my own. There was one album by Oscar Peterson, uh, Ray Brown, Milt Jackson, and Louis Hayes. And every time I sat down and tried to play to that album, my dad would say, mm, that's not working. <laughs> Everything else is working. That, the jazz thing is not happening. So that has been running in the back of my head for a long time to this day. I sit down and I still hear the voice, yeah, that's not working. So I decided to come learn to how to play it here at the source. I originally wanted to go to New York. I didn't know anyone in New York, and I had three friends in L.A., and I had a wife and a kid. So I said, okay, L.A. it is. And I ended up going to school at Cal Arts. I was a 27-year-old freshman. Hmm. And um, I studied there I studied with Tootie Heath for a year and three years with Joe LaBarbera. Wow. So that straightened me up. <clears throat> okay. So how, how did that lead you into the professional scene? Did you do the traditional, you know, go to the union? I, it's the funniest of things. Um, I moved to L.A. because I would not know anyone and I would not be gigging so I could focus on my classwork because I wanted to learn. I got here in January of 91. In March, I get a call to play with Arturo Sandoval. Wow. And I said no, <laughs> because I was in the middle of the semester. Okay. Around October of that same year, they called again. And my then wife said, they're not gonna call you a third time, so you better go. And I started playing with him, and yeah. I played with him for uh, four years nonstop, and then another year after so I, I, play, I played with him for a total of five years, and wow. we did three albums, and it was, it was amazing. The first, the first time we went to Europe, the first show we did was opening for Freddie Hubbard. Wow. And the drummer was Louis Hayes. Okay. It Full was circle. Like, exactly. Yeah. It was like, <gasps> maybe, <It's> I'm, <laughs> maybe I'm meant to do this. Yeah. So... So but you yeah, got lucky. I got you, yeah. really lucky. I yeah, got most people really don't get a second call. I no. Mean, you get one chance. And yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
That's cool. So in that time between then, your first gig with Arturo Sandoval, and now, mm -hmm. what are some of your favorite projects you've uh, been a part of? Uh, let's see. I've played it, nothing recorded, but I played with Dori Caimi. That was amazing. I played last year with Chico Pinero, who's one of my favorite musicians on the planet. He's unbelievable. I got to play with him. I was yeah. I was so giddy. You have no idea. <laughs> I was so happy. I've I've been blessed to play with Oscar Hernandez, who played piano and arranged some of the tunes on my most influential album of the salsa genre, which is Ray Barreto's uh, Reconstruction. So we did a, I did a gig with Oscar in Mexico, and on the way there, we were driving, and on the way there, we listened to the album. Yeah. And it was, it was a great experience. Wow. Okay. But also, um, also what we did. Available uh, on iTunes. You can put uh, the album. Yes, it's a digital right download. <laughs> um, a Liar's Promise is the name of the album, and I did it with Greg and Carrie Frank on organ. So it's organ, saxophone, and drums. It's really fun. Yeah. Because I m neither of my kids play music, so that's the closest I will get ever get to playing with my kids. Oh. Well, maybe you could tell the story of your first album <laughs> and what led to the, the actual <laughs> title of, of that second album. Yeah, that's a funny story. My compadre, my brother from another mother, uh, Otmaro Ruiz uh, and I were talking about me doing an album and I said, absolutely not. I am not ever going to do a solo album. That is not a thing. I don't want it. I'm not interested. Fast forward nine months, 10 months, and he said that he had been contacted by a Korean university and that they were going to do a series of instructional uh, albums and that he wanted to start with the drum album and I said I don't want any part of it call Jimmy Branley mm. and he said no Jimmy's gonna record it so we're all making money it's like okay whatever we'll make money fine so I start selecting tunes and he does all the arranging he does all the recording I come in last I record drums and percussion and then he says okay so the Koreans are coming they're gonna pay us cash but they want to meet you they actually want to meet you because they were really impressed with the album. <laughs> okay. So I show up. Um, uh, my son was with me, at, uh, my oldest son. And he says, oh, Dad, you know, uh, I'm not feeling well. I, I think I'm going to, I, I don't want to, can I go with you wherever you're going? And I said, oh, I'm sorry, hijo. I'm, I'm going to meet these people. It's going to be boring, but of, co of course you're welcome to come with me. Yeah, I think yeah, I think I want to go with you. I'm, I'm not feeling well. We get to Otmaro's place, and Otmaro says, oh, man, the, the guys are not here, but in the studio, I have a cable that we need to play it for them here at the li in the living room. And I go into the studio, and everybody who had recorded was there. The album was pressed. I started yelling and screaming all sorts of obscenities I at remember. them. You remember? <laughs> and uh, my ex-wife was there. Both my kids were there. My ex-wife knew about this way, way before I did. My brother had bankrolled the whole operation. Everybody behind my back. That was my 50th birthday present from my compadre. Yeah. So now, at this point, I have a, a, a solo album. And I said, I'm never doing this ever again. And then when I called you and, Gar and Carrie to, to do the gig at Mambo's, it felt so good. From the rehearsal, I called the studio. And I booked the studio and we recorded and it was, it's, it's awesome. But, you know, I lied. I promised yeah. that I would never do another album and I had to. So a liar's promise. A liar's promise. Fitting title. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, that was that is a fun group to play in. Yeah, I remember the the very first, uh, actually the very last track on your album is it's just me and you. Yeah, on your first album. On the first and, one. Yeah, uh, 
Ot Morrow had called me and he said, oh, we're just going to do, you know, a standard jazz tune. What mm. is this thing called love? Like pretty fast, probably. Yeah. So I was like, okay, you know, Ot Morrow's going to be playing piano yeah. and Edwin or Darek is going to play bass. And it was I just get there and it's just you, and, you <laughs> and me. And I did not know what to do. So he's like, amigo, just go crazy. <laughs> and so I, I played what I thought he wanted. And then the next take, he's like, amigo, you can play crazier. Mm -hmm. And so I just went crazy as, you know, as much as I could. And by the end of that second take, there, a screw had worked its way out of my saxophone. <laughs> and the, the key post just fell off. So, like, my sax was done. And that, <laughs> that was, like, the fitting take that we got. Uh, that's and, it. And we got some attention on the Grammy ballot. For yeah, that, we did. That track. So we did. Yeah, that was cool. That was fun. That was really fun. So anyway, <clears throat> um, we're here at MSA. Yes. You're teaching all the classes uh, for this Thursday and Friday. And, yes. And uh, a lot of our kids uh, at varying levels, you know, maybe they aspire to be professional mm. or maybe they aspire to continue with the arts uh, after high school in varying capacities, mm -hmm. varying levels. Um, what are some of the qualities of the artists that you seek out to collaborate with? that our kids could emulate? Uh, I tend to gravitate towards people that have no ego, that they put um, music first and um, also excellence. You know, if, if, and that goes for writers, painters, uh, comedians, all kinds of people, if you strive for excellence and you prioritize what you want to do, I want to hang out with you. Yeah. If, if you're, you know, if you're dedicated to music and you play at the service of music, you're, you're good. Right. You're good in my book. I'm, I'm there with you. I will go through hell with and for you. If, on the other hand, you're doing music just to attract attention to yourself, I want no part of it. Yeah. I don't want, that's not what I want to do. So, when, and nothing is perfect, of course, and there's a bunch of drawbacks, but my experience in Japan is that when you're in a taxi, that taxi driver wants to be the best taxi driver in Japan. And that's how they behave, and that's how they carry themselves. Did they set out to be a taxi driver? I don't know. What I do know is that at that moment, that person has pride on what they do, and they want to do it to the best of their abilities. That's all I want. That's I. That's the kind of people I want to surround myself with. That's the taxi driver you want to hang out with. Yeah. Yeah. Th that's the one you want driving you. Yeah. You know. So you want to be around the people that are hungry, that leave their ego at the door. Mm -hmm. And that are that you know have enough conviction and determination to pursue whatever it is they're doing to the best of their ability. Yeah. What else can you ask for? Yeah. Not much. Hmm. I don't know. Th that's that's the stuff that th that attracts me. Yeah. I think I'm pretty similar. Mm. So I have one final. It's not really a question. Yes. It's a it's a debate of ours. Oh, this is a this is the argument. Okay. Yeah. So we've been debating it for years. Okay. And I think I've come up with the ultimate argument to shut your uh, self defacing part of the argument down okay. but we've always debated you've always told me you're a craftsman yes and not an artist yes right you see yourself as a craftsman i am a carpenter i'm um, not a sculptor for me i'm i'm looking at your discography and i'm looking at the people that you collaborate with mm -hmm. it's one thing for you know there's there's a certain type of artist uh who maybe is had a more glamorous career a couple of years mm -hmm. ago and decides to call younger people to kind of refresh, you know, like Herbie's done it. Mm -hmm. Kenny Garrett's done it. Miles Davis was probably the first guy yeah. to like really rely on that 
to happen. Art Blakey too. Um, Art Blakey, right? His Roy whole Haynes. career. Yeah. Um, but for you, uh, the the reason I I see you as an artist is because your sound is what is sought out by people from Bob Mincer's generation. You know, he's seventy now. <laughs> people his age and older call you to do drums and percussion. But you're also, like last year, you were on an album with Lewis Cole and Sam Wilkes and Jacob Mann. Yeah. Like, they call you because they want your sound. Right? So it's it doesn't matter what the age is, necessarily. It's like, they want a own. They want that artist in the studio. And I would counter-argue that they want somebody to play for the music, not to create something within that music. So if, if I think I'm getting called because I can surrender my ego and play what's needed for the music, and that's, it could be considered an artistic statement, but it's not, I'm not discovering hot water okay. or anything <laughs> like that. I'm just, I think if I'm getting called calls from, for something I do, it would be my listening skills. Because I try to listen more than I try to play. Yeah. Some people come to play music with an agenda of, oh, I've been practicing this, so I'm going to use it, or I've been doing that, and this is my signature, and this is my style, and I'm going to play that way and only that way. Yeah, that I would categorize as craftsman. Oh, right? interesting. Because you... You're used to producing a certain piece of the puzzle, and yeah. it's like here's that piece. Like I hope you can complete your puzzle. But uh, I know for musicians of my generation, we see Lewis Cole and, mm -hmm. and Jacob Mann as kind of the forefront of, yes. of this thing that's happening right now. And they're not going to call someone that doesn't know how to just like be an artist around. They're not going to call mm. a craftsman Interesting. to do a gig like that or a recording that's captured for all time. Hmm. I'm flattered, but I'm annoyed because I don't have an answer <laughs> right I now. Because I win. I, mm. This argument is settled. It's, uh, I, mm. Interesting. The other thing, S you know, is uh, being around artists leads to the creation of new art, inspires new art. With craftsmen, it's more of a job. Yeah. Right? And just seeing you around my kids just today one out of two days they're talking they're practicing they're mm. you know they're inspired so it it seems an awful lot like artistry to me mm. interesting well art is anything you create yeah right and and it, it's something that produces a visceral reaction not an intellectual one it, so you might hate it. It's still a visceral reaction. Yeah. You say, I don't know. I don't like it. I don't know why, but I don't like it. That's a visceral reaction. That's art. Yeah. That's, so under those circumstances, okay, fine. But I am first and foremost a drummer or a rhythmist. My sense of melody is boom, boom, that's it. And... So for me to consider myself an artist, I would have to be creating something new every time. And that's what you guys are doing. I'm just trying to service your creation. In that sense, I am not the artist. You guys are. And I am just a tool to express that art. Does that make sense? It does, yeah. I think so we, we all have to have a certain amount of craftsmen in us. Yeah, you know, of like course. We've, we've done sessions together Yeah, where, you know, the one we did for Jason Goldman at the Firehouse. Right? That's right. All of it sounded like 1940s Duke Ellington. Yeah. So it would be really weird if I was playing like Chris Potter or David Sanborn, right? I have to exactly. capture that vibe. So that's thoroughly craftsman territory. I can't be myself on that session exactly but aspects of 
Paul Gonzalez and Johnny Hodges are in me when I'm doing my own thing, right? So it feeds my own sense of artistry. Like I couldn't, you were saying that today, you can't just spontaneously yeah. create a new style just in the moment. Out of thin it's, air. That's it's informed by what happened in Cuba, what happened in New Orleans, what happened in Brazil. Exactly. You know, so I do think we all have to be craftsmen to some extent, but it's it's what you do with it and then how you're perceived and uh, your mindset going into it. Yeah. Like, are you trying to sell records? Oh. Are you, you know, I rapping about your your body parts or you know like that's not art that's that's cheap no it is art you know but it's it's the lowest common denominator it's a right. it's it's it it's art from the standpoint of a creation does it ring true with me not really not particularly yeah i can't relate to that but if you start finding where it comes from if you look at it as artists reflecting on society, which is what we all should be doing, we should all be uh, social critics, then it is valid. Yeah. And it's a representation of where society is right now. Do I like it? Not in the least. I don't like where we're heading. I don't like what's happened. I don't like what's happening. Uh, but music and culture in, re in general is going to reflect that situation. It has to. It, it's, you know, comedians have to criticize. Com the, the artists have to paint. Writers have to write. Musicians have to compose in um, uh, reaction to what's happening around us. That's... I think that's part of, of our mission. Because it's not all, you know, commercial music, radio, airplay. Yeah. That Yeah, that, that has a function. The function is you don't hear your own thoughts. So you're numb all day. Um, people are afraid of silence. Really afraid of silence. That's why, you know, when you do a corporate gig or a wedding... They have a cocktail hour band and they have the pre-dinner band and then DJ. the dancing band and then the DJ. Yeah. They don't <laughs> want empty space because then people are forced to hear their own thoughts yeah. and they're not going to like what's happening because it's either weird stuff or nothing at all. Crickets, yeah. So in that sense, music is functional. At that point, it's functional music. Mm -hmm. It's not art music. Yeah. So, yeah, I go back and forth Okay. on all that so stuff. So 50% artists, 50% craftsmen, or yes, some give and take. Yeah, I would say 60, I'll get you 40, to admit that you're an artist at some point. Sometimes. Speaking of which, yes. Aron Serfati, guest artist, tomorrow night, tomorrow October night. 4th, uh, 7 p.m. in our Performing Arts Center, playing a gig with Jazz One. Yes, that's gonna be really yeah, fun. This kid, mm. you need to you need to come and watch these kids play. Yeah, this is gonna be fun. And if you can't get enough of Aron Serfati, go to iTunes, <laughs> buy In the Game and A Liar's Promise. <laughs> so, thank you for. Uh, Greg Johnson is my manager. <laughs> He's getting twenty five percent. Exactly. <laughs> I get a cut of all the albums that you've played on of mine. <laughs> Well, awesome. that's for my tunes, but anyway, yes. thank you for coming into MSA. Thank you. We love having you here. Thank you for the invite. It's, it's wonderful being here. It's awesome. really great. Yeah, yeah.